morning, seeing one another, worshiping together this morning, knowing that God has favored us. As if you stand to your feet as we go into worship this morning. a communication with you on today. God, we pray that you would remove it right now in the name of Jesus that we can receive something from you that we can apply to our everyday living. Now, God, have thine own way like only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, this is another Sunday, another chance that God has blessed us and kept us and we are excited and I thank God for everyone that is here on today. Those that may be on their way, amen. Uh, and those that are watching online, we don't take it lightly. We appreciate you. Uh, you got out of your good warm bed this morning, amen. And you came on into the house. So as always, since we are already in the house, since you got out your bed, amen. Since you looked in the mirror and got all dolled up, you might as well go on and praise the Lord for all of the good things that he has done, amen. Just this week alone, you don't even have to look back for Some of us, we can look at yesterday and say, look how good God has been and the blessings he continuously pour out unto us day after day. All right, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep having and going to turn it over to our praise and worship and allow them to take us higher this morning. Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. You are good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Just a uh, few announcements that we want to get out this morning. Uh, as always, as always, as always, we're praying for our known sick and shut in, all of those uh, members and uh names that we do have. We are still praying for our very own Mother Pearson, that uh, God continues to move and bless like only he can. Amen. Uh, we also want to lift uh, Pastor Bruce Datcher uh, up in prayer. We found out that he had to go to the hospital late last night, so we are uh, lifting him uh, up as well. Uh, Bible study. Listen, Bible study has been going strong. Those have the, of you who have been tuning in, amen, praise the Lord. We've been having a good time on Bible study, amen. So I encourage you, invite you to tune in uh, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You don't even have to leave your house. All you have to do is just log in the Facebook, amen, Facebook Live. We're on there or go to our website www.gbdallas.com click and it's right there it's live we right on there as well so we encourage you to uh, join us for Bible study right now it's online uh, we are tentatively looking I am tentatively looking at uh, trying to figure out when we can come back in the house amen amen I can say that I've been watching the numbers and looks like Looks like, I ain't gonna jump the gun and get too excited, but it looks like numbers have been going down. Amen. Amen. Numbers have been going down. So that is a good thing. But don't y'all stop praying. Don't y'all stop doing what's necessary to stay safe. Amen. So y'all keep all of that in your hearts and minds and know that looks like we're going forward and getting a little bit better. Uh, also, let's pray. Let's pray for... Uh, the world in general. I don't know if you've been paying attention. I've been paying attention diligently on this uh, Russia and Ukraine incident that has taken place because the last thing that I want to happen is uh, it's horrible what's going on, but I don't want us to have to get involved. Amen. Because when we have to get involved, that means a lot of people's sons and daughters might have to go to that dangerous place. So listen, I am praying diligently that this comes to a resolve. And I know God is able. Uh, he's not an author of confusion. He wants us to have peace. So I'm praying and praying diligently that we can uh, get through this and get this over with as fast as can be. Um, also, also, this is our fourth Sunday, our family and friends. And I am looking around and I am excited about the fact of those who brought and invited the family that are with you, the friends that are with you. Listen, let me say on behalf of Pastor McNeil and his absence and the Great Elder Church family, we welcome each of you. Amen. We welcome you and we encourage you uh, to join in this service. Have a good time. Praise the Lord. Stand on your feet. Clap your hand. Ain't nobody going to look at you strange. We're going to get up with you. Amen. Because we came to have a good time in the name of the Lord this morning. So welcome to each of you. And we hope and pray that you something can encourage you in your walk with Christ. And that you can come back and visit us one more time. Uh, last but not least, uh, there is a celebratory announcement that we want to make for uh, one of our very own uh, Sister Sakara Ford. Amen. Sister Sakara Ford has been blessed enough and pushed hard enough and worked hard enough. Now she has been promoted to sergeant for the Arlington Police Department. Amen. Amen. We celebrate and praise the Lord that God not only has protected her and kept her throughout the years, but is now showing elevation for her due diligence and her service. And I believe that her uh, actual promotion ceremony is this coming Friday, I believe she said. Uh, so we uh, wish her all the best 
and still continue God's covering and blessing upon her. Amen. All right, I believe that's all of the announcements that I have at this time, but let's do this before we go any further. Uh, Y'all know we want to worship the Lord together, collectively, and this is the part where we all can do it together and collectively through our tithe and our offering. Amen. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver, and we want to be obedient unto God. Listen, it's all right to sow seeds into good ground, and when you sow seed into good ground, You'll see what God can do. He'll take it. He'll bless it. He'll manifest it. But not only that, he'll look at you in your heart and say, because you sowed seed into good ground and you trust in him, he'll bless you just the same. Amen. Brother High is standing. Uh, I don't see nobody here. All right. Uh, Brother High. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> With the highest understanding to receive our tithe and our offering. If you need to be serviced by an usher with an envelope or anything that you need, please raise your hands and they will ensure that you have whatever it is that you need this morning. Amen. And amen. Our trio has continuously blessed us week after week. And I am thankful unto God for y'all because y'all make it easy for me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I do have, praise the Lord, a couple of guests that have came. Uh, I got two sisters that's here today. Amen. 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 My wife's sister is here. Uh, my sister, Kimber. Amen. Thank you for coming. Uh, and as I look out the window, I see my daughter come. My family uh, got tied up with some other engagements today, so uh, we praying that God clears all that up, but that's all right. Uh, then my, my sister, sister, amen, Sister Tam is here. Thank you, thank you so much for coming and sharing as well. All right, ushers, we're in your hands.
let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, how we thank you for this time of giving. We ask that the offering be used for which it is given, which is kingdom building. Bless those that gave, those that had the desire to give, but had it not. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Listen, um, y'all know that uh, we have been blessed in this church to have some singers. Amen. Amen. We have some singles in the house and last Sunday there was requests made and y'all don't understand sometimes when people make a request we have to do everything we can to fulfill those requests amen because you never know when it might be somebody's last time amen amen I'm not saying it's anybody's last time but the world we live in and the things that we've had to go through and we've endured Amen. We want to honor wishes. So a request has been made for our very own for Keelan Scott to come and bless us in song this morning. Amen. So we will hear from him and then after him we will hear what thus says the Lord. Amen. Oh Lord, we give you praise.
have your Bibles, and I pray that you do on your devices. I'm going to ask that you would turn with me to a familiar few verses of Scripture found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse number 6. When we found it, I'm going to ask that you would stand in honor and reverence to the reading of the Word of God. Second Corinthians 12, beginning at verse number 6. We found it, say amen. amen. You still look and say, Lord, help. All right, looks like we are all there. And it reads as follows from the NIV version. It says, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool. Because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say or what I do. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Amen. May the Lord and the blessings of readers, hearers, most of all the doers of his holy word. If you don't mind allowing me to use just for a few moments a thought or a subject, matured grace. Amen. Matured grace. Now, God, how I thank you for this, another chance to be able to, be able to declare your word. Now, God, I pray that you would sit me down, that you may stand, that these your people may not see me, but see you, that these your people may not hear me, but hear you. God, we pray that something can be said, that it may prick someone's heart, that they may want to fall out from the wicked ways of this world and come running, saying, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Now, strengthen us, feed us till we want no more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Listen, I can vividly remember the adults of my childhood because they had a determination to make sure that there was always a proper separation between grown folk and children. The adults of our childhood were sticklers for making sure that there was a clear line of demarcation between what grown folk could do and what children could do. And, and unfortunately, unlike many parents of today who try to be a pal or a buddy or BFF with their children, the adults of our childhood wouldn't have any of that. They would make sure that you understood that I am the adult and you are the child. And sometimes we, they, they, well, even when they got ready to have certain conversations, they would put the children out the room because they was getting ready to do some grown folks conversation and grown folk talk. They knew that there were certain conversations that were appropriate for adults, but would be inappropriate for a child. Even with television and the movie industry, they understand this, and that's why they have ratings on television shows and movies, because some of it can be age sensitive. 
As a matter of fact, even in our house, when Dixon wants to uh, download certain games on his iPad, he already knows how to check the age-appropriate rating on the game. And anything over his age, he already knows, well, I can't get that game. So games, television, movies, shows all understand that there, are, that, that there are even some movies that, that are appropriate for adults and childs. That's why they rate them either G, PG, PG-13, or R for their ratings. They say that it's restricted for mature audiences only. And, and if there was ever a text, or a scripture in the Bible that ought to be rated for mature audiences only, it is this text that we have before us today. What Paul is talking about, he's concerning the grace of God and the role of the grace of God, enabling the child of God to live a victorious and overcoming life. Listen, grace is such a wonderful subject. It's a, it's a powerful subject. It's a great subject. There are many definitions and descriptions out there on this word grace. For some, uh, the grace of God is the God's unmerited favor. For others, the grace of God is God given to us that which we don't deserve. Still, yet God's grace is simply God's free gift to us. And each of these definitions hold a certain amount of truth to them. However, have you ever considered the fact that there is another side of the grace of God that doesn't really look like grace at all? It's painful and it's unpleasant side of grace of God that, that often challenges our notions on the nature of God's goodness in our lives. Have you ever stopped to consider the fact that, that, that God's grace is evident? We even, even when he gives us to gives us things that we don't deserve, we see, oh, that's God's grace. I didn't deserve it, but he gave it to me anyway. But what we have to understand that God's grace is also evident when he allows us to experience that which we don't like. That there is a painful side, an unpleasant side of grace, uh, of God. That side that we really don't want to look at. And as a matter of fact, if you, if you think about it, it's one of those things that, uh, uh, it's one of the less played keys on the piano that, that don't like to get played. Or it's one of those less things that we want to talk about because we don't want to have to go through it. We avoid it because we, 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 we only want to talk about the good thing. We, we love to talk about that grace that saved us from our sins, that, 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 that saved grace. We love to talk about the grace when he blessed us with something. But what about when he blesses us and through the grace of God allows us to endure the afflictions of life? That, that sustaining grace. And no one is more qualified to talk about this sustaining grace of God other than the Apostle Paul. For, for in the same text, he describes both a high moment of ecstasy and a low moment of agony. He, he allows us to tag along with him into a place that is being described as the third heaven where he was just shown visions and revelations that no other person or the man or the woman has ever seen before. But in the same breath, he allows us to now walk with him down that lonely corridor of his pain and his agony. And while we both experience and express the aspects of the grace of God, it is that pain and unpleasant side of God's grace that I want to highlight this morning. Because truth be told, there are some melodies of the music of our lives, some chords of, the li of our lives' music that can be heard only when we have the courage to hear it. Only when we put ourselves open enough to say, God, not my will, but thy will be done. The Lord put me on this on my put this on my heart this morning because someone came in here or is watching online 
with a smile on your face. You came in with a hallelujah in your belly. You came in with uplifted hands. But the truth be told, behind your smiles, behind your hallelujahs, behind when you raising your hands and I lifted up, somebody is wondering, Lord, why am I going through? what I'm going through. How is it that I'm going through whatever it is that I'm going through? And how much am I going to have to go through right now? But I have some news to share with you. That if your spiritual antenna is up, you will discover that God's grace is not only evident when he allows you to experience what you don't deserve, but God's grace is also evident when he allows you to experience what you don't like. And so, if you don't mind, let me just escort you through this text. Let's unpack it. Let's see what it has to say. Let me show you what God has shown me, and I'll be out your way. I just want to highlight some of the, the, the movements of the text because it's moving, it's fluid, and the text is moving consistently, so I won't spend much time. I want to go with the flow of it. So here's the first thing that I notice that a predicament was mentioned. Paul had gone to the third heaven where he had been shown revelations that no mortal man or woman has ever seen before. Now he has come back down from the mountain of ecstasy to the valley of the reality of his pain and agony. And when Paul gets back to reality, he shares with us that he found himself facing a predicament. And when you look at this predicament that he faced, you will notice a couple of things. You will notice first that it is an irritating sensation. It says that he has a thorn, verse 7, he has a thorn in the flesh that was given to him. The, the, the word thorn literally means sharp, like, like a snake, like a splinter, I, I, something that is sharp. He speaks metaphorically by describing his condition as somebody taking a snake and driving it into his flesh. He says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, now, now we don't know what this thorn was. There's a lot of speculation on what this thorn was. Some speculate that the, the thorn in his flesh might have been some human personality. That Paul had some human haters in Corinth who would continuously dogging him out because they had been challenging his authenticity of his apostolic calling. They were suggesting that Paul was not a full apostle because he was not one of the original 12. But also, maybe Paul's thorn might have been some human haters who were hating on him just off of general purposes. Have you ever met folk like that? Oh, yeah. that, that? That you've never done anything to them, but they seem to hate you just because they can. Uh, others speculate that, that, that Paul's thorn in his flesh might have been his own sin. His own shortcomings and limitations for, if you, if you pay attention, the Corinthians, they criticized Paul on two fronts. They criticized him on the basis of his appearance. Because historians say Paul was not known to be a handsome man. But, but history says that he may have been short and bald-headed and some type of facial contusion. Even in the letter, it says his physical appearance is weak. But others are even criticizing his preaching. They say, well, he's a good writer, but he can't preach. And so maybe the thorn in his flesh was an ongoing criticism that he had to face every day that reminded him of his limitations and his shortcomings. Others even speculate that the thorn in his flesh might have been some besetting sin in his life that he could ever overcome. While others even speculate that he was more likely to have some type of visual image, some type of problem with his eyes. We don't really know, but the truth of it is, the truth of it is, it's not really that important what the thorn was. But whatever it was, it bothered him. 
Whatever it was, it hurt him. Whatever it was, it caused him to live in pain. And the paradox of it all is that God permitted him to have it. Listen, listen, every now and again, every now and then, God would allow even the child of God to face a set of painful circumstances that we don't like, that we don't want. And, and, and I know that we I know we live in a day in a world where we are consistently hearing that we have the blessings of Abraham on your life. And because and such it, and everybody, all of us think because we hear that over and over and over again that we're just supposed to have this healthy life. Everybody's supposed to have this wealthy life. Everybody's supposed to just live a happy go look at life. And nobody is ever supposed to be sick or have any problems but look at Paul Paul reminds us that even the child of God sometimes has to uh, is allowed to experience pain that we don't like much like he did in the case of his only begotten son Jesus Y'all heard the story in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane where sweat like drops of blood came from his, bow, his brow. And even in Jesus' agony, Jesus looks at his father and says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The point that I'm making is that even if God allows his only begotten son, Jesus to face some pain and fall to face some pain. Don't you not know that even you, God would allow you to go through some pain. God would allow you to go through an irritating cessation. But wait, but wait, watch this, watch this. It is also satanically influenced, Lord have mercy. It's also satanically influenced. He said a messenger, a carrier of Satan sent to torment me. Another version may say he was sent to buffet me. That word means to hit, to strike with a fist. It means to beat somebody down. It means to throw hands. It means to, you're going to knock somebody out. And in the present tense, which it means, it wasn't just a one-time blow. But it was a continual blow over and over and over again. He says, every day, this thing bothers me. Every day it howls me. Every day it hurts me. Every day it's causing me to bleed. He describes it as God allowing the devil, Lord have mercy, to bring it to him. And sometimes, sometimes God does allow the devil to bring a set of evil circumstances to you to come into your life. If you don't believe me, look, go back to the book of Job where God permitted the devil to bring evil into Job's life but there's a silver lining in the case of Job that, that it seems to suggest that Satan does not have free reign in the child of God and before the devil can do anything in your life he has to first get permission and if God permits him that must mean, watch this, if God permits the devil to do some evil in your life, that must mean that he can trust you with the trouble. He says, have you considered my servant, Job? Look at it, that, that, that's trust right there. Have you considered my servant, Job? Look at the scandal in that. It's almost like God is sinking the devil on his own child. He says, I trust Job with trouble. But wait, wait, remember, remember I said that the text is moving. I said we can't stay here. It's moving and it comes right on the heels of this because after the predicament is mentioned, we notice that a purpose is manifested. We notice that a purpose is manifested. Watch this. He says, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. He said, I didn't get this thorn by accident. I just didn't get this thorn by Coincidence? He said, this was given to me. That somebody on purpose gave this thorn to me. Which means that although my thorn causes me to hurt, yeah, yeah. it is a gift to me. That, 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 that sometimes God allows us to have the gift of pain. In order to make us what he wants us to be. God uses pain to 
to make us the people of God that he wants us to be. Yo, what's your purpose, Paul? What are you trying to say? Why did God allow you to have this thorn? Well, I'm glad you asked. First of all, it was to remind others of his humanity. It reminded others of his humanity. Watch what it says. Verse 6. Lest anyone or so no one should think more of me above what else or what people seem to be, what they hear, what they see. He said, lest nobody else think that. You, you, you see that word think? The word think is a mathematical metaphor. That literally means to calculate. Remember, Paul had gone to the third heaven, seen what nobody else has seen, and Paul understood that when you have had that type of mountaintop experience and success, that other people might have gotten an over-calculated estimation of his worth. Listen, I, I, Paul, you done been up there with, with the big dogs. Paul, you done made it up with the high folk. You done been and seen some things. So Paul had to break it down and say, listen, let me remind all of y'all that I'm just a man. Listen, you remember uh, uh, that he said there was given to me a thorn. Paul understood that the people who, when they see him, he didn't want them to think that he was all successful. He didn't want them to think that, that they needed to put him on a pedestal where only God belongs. He said, I'm a man. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, in the book, uh, the book of Acts, he and Barnabas, Barnabas they was uh, in a certain city, and the Bible says that they had healed a crippled man. And they began to bow down and worship Paul. And Paul tore off his clothes to reveal his flesh and said, listen, don't worship me. He said, don't worship me. I'm just a man of like passion. As a matter of fact, that right there is so relevant right now in America. That is so relevant in America because we live in a country that has a strong hero me. We, we live in a country where you, you, you have to have something to idolize. Someone to put on a pedestal because, uh, uh, because the idol becomes some type of projection in your own life. Some target that you're trying to hit, that you're trying to get to, that you wish you were, but you are not. So, so, so even our young people, our young people idolize rap stars. America idolizes her movie stars. And, and isn't it ironic that at some point in time, the number one television show on TV was called American Idol. And, and, and what I'm afraid of is, is being shown to us through this idolization that it may sometimes even creep or has crept into the church. I, I'm sure, I'm sure if you watch television and the reality shows, and unfortunately there was a television show, a reality show about pastors, I'm sure if you, you probably even met some preachers that the church that, that has come to a point to where they don't just love the pastor, they worship the pastor. And as a matter of fact, some of these jokers got more security than President Biden and don't have but about 75 members. And don't nobody know their names. But watch this. You, you, can even, you, you can't even shake some of these pastors' hands. You can't get to them because of the security and whatever. But listen, the Bible says that we have not the high priest who you cannot touch with the feelings of our infirmities. Now something is wrong with that when you can touch Jesus, but you can't touch the pastor. Listen, let, listen, let, let, let me just throw this out there for free. I appreciate the fact that some of y'all love me, you respect me, you care, and you show showing your love, and you displayed all of those things. But listen, don't worship me, because I'm just a man. Listen, my calling is from God, but I came from the ground. My calling is from the divine, but I came from the dust. My calling is from the sky, but I came from the salt. Don't worship me, worship God. Because he's the only one who deserves all of your praises, all of your hallelujahs, all of your shouting, all of your thank you. So don't worship me, worship God. So sometimes in order to help people have a proper estimation of the leader, God has to let the leader bleed. And 
Here Paul says, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's another purpose. Not only was it to remind others of his humanity, but it was also so that he could retain his humility. Verse 7 says, because of these surpassing revelations, or your, 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 your version may say, and, and lest I should be exalted above measures by the abundance of the revelations. In other words, let me just give you one word that sums all that up. Conceited. Paul now turns a spotlight of critical analysis upon himself. He, he had gone to the third heaven. He had seen what nobody else had seen before. He, and that kind of ministerial success, Paul understood that there's often a correlation between success and conceitedness. Success and getting the big head. Success and feeling yourself. Success and thinking that you've done something that you ain't had no control over doing. So in order for me to keep my feet squarely on the ground, says there was given to me, gifted to me a thorn in my flesh. And I believe that God wants to bless some of us. I believe that he wants to help us out. I believe that he wants to tell us some things that by telling us, this is what I think he wants to tell us. God wants to bless some of us. I believe that he wants to bless some of us. But I believe that God can't afford to bless some of us. I'll say that one more time. I know y'all got quiet right there. God wants to bless some of us, but God can't afford to bless some of us. Because when some of us make a nickel more than somebody else, we walk around with our nose in the air. Your nose is so far lifted up, if it rain, you're drowning. So in order to keep your feet on the ground, there was given a thorn in the flesh. It is suggested, watch this, it's suggested that uh, wise ship makers, those that make the ships, those that make boats, they, 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 it's suggested that the taller that they make the ship's superstructure, the sail, the mass that ascends up, the heavier the bottom or the balance of the ship has to be. Because if the ship has a tall sail and a light bottom, the wind catches the sail, lifts the ship up out of the water, and the ship loses its buoyancy and flips over and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So why, the wise ship maker knows that the taller that I make the sail, the heavier I have to make the bottom. I have to put uh, 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 put on it some heavy stuff. I might, I might, I might, I might have to put some things on it to weigh it down. And in order for me to do that, it might, I might have to put some stuff on you that you have to go through, so that you have to understand when God is trying to lift you up. When God is elevating you and taking you higher, when God is trying to take you to the next level, sometimes he's had to make sure that you're still well grounded. Sometimes he has to make sure that wherever he's taking you higher, that you still understand and realize that you still have to stay grounded in the word of God. Because if you get too big headed and the cell that you lifted up that he's elevated you to, the wind catches hold of and you start, and listen, what I mean by the wind, I mean those voices, those people that start saying, oh, you sure doing a good job. Oh, you sure doing this. You sure doing, as a matter of fact, it, it, can, it can even be the wind of you getting away. You may have thought, oh, I did everything that the doctor said. I done worked out. I done lost weight. I done took all my medication. Every, we all start to think that because we made it to another level, that it's something that we did. But in order to humble ourselves, in order for God to keep you well grounded, in order so you don't come up out the water and be flipped over and sink all the way to the bottom and have to start again, he says, I got to put something on you to keep you humble. He said, that was given to me. A thorn in my flesh. Because I don't want you to get too big headed. I don't want you to get too confident. I don't want you to get to a place to where you think that it was all about you. No, God is the only one 
who deserves all the praise. So here it is. Here's the word for the day. And I promise you, I'm going to sit on down. Here's the word that I want you to, to look at. The question that we have for you today is this. How high? Here's what God is asking you. How high can I lift you without losing you? How high can I lift you without losing you? That, 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 that was given to me. I thought, but watch this, the text is still moving. I can't stay here, it's still moving because there's another movement behind that one. And here it is, that, the, that a petition was made. Paul said he prayed about it. Prayed about it. Here it is in verse, verse 8, he said he's prayed about it. But notice, notice about the prayer. First of all, he was sincere. Watch it, it says, he says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord. I pleaded with the Lord. That, that word pleaded means to call to one side for help and aid in the time of need. In other words, Paul said, when I prayed about my thorn, he said, I didn't play when I prayed. He said, I was pleading when I prayed. In other words, I was sincere. I was begging. I got ugly in prayer. Listen, have you ever gotten ugly in prayer? Have you ever got ugly in prayer when you didn't care how your makeup looked? When you didn't care if anybody saw that your nose was running? When you didn't care how you looked because you needed God to know and you needed a need, a need that needed to be met only by God? Sometimes you have to get ugly in your prayer. The effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avail as much, which means that if you, if you expect your prayers to mean anything to God, they have to mean everything. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Not only was he sincere, he was also systematic. He says, I didn't pray about this thing one time. He said, I didn't pray about it two times. He says, but I had three times I pleaded with God to remove this thorn. And I would like to think that the pathos and the ethos in which he prayed might have gone a little bit like this. Please, God, remove this thorn. Please, God, give me some release. Please, God, give me, change my situation. Has anybody ever been there where you had to bow down on your knees and say, please, God, just have thine own way. Please, God, heal my mama. Please, God, touch my body. Please, God, restore my marriage. God, please move right now in the name of Jesus. Have you ever been there? Where you had to cry out more than once. Where you had to cry out a few times to tell the Lord, listen, I need you right now to move in my heart, move in my life, move. He says, I pleaded, pleaded with him. Oh, I just, I can't stay there, I can't stay there. It's still moving, it's still moving right on the heels of that. God wasted no time. Answering Paul's prayer. So, so the prayer is answered and it's manifested. But right here, right there, right here is where I really want you to get a good understanding. His prayer was answered. His prayer was answered. But it wasn't the answer that he was expecting. Listen to what he says. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, Paul, you are my son. Paul, you are my special apostle. You are my anointed servant. But Paul, the answer is no. Request denied. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. That, great, that, that word sufficient means enough. So here, child of God, is the other side of grace. The grace that is not for little boys or little girls. But this grace is for the mature saints. Because immature people can only see the grace of God when he says yes. But when you walk with God for a while, 
When you, when you, you can also see the grace of God when he says no. My grace is sufficient for you. Listen, some people say the reason that God said no was because there wasn't enough faith. But I beg to differ that this is not some sophomore newcomer and that, that's praying right here. This is not some neophyte that's still wet behind the ear. This is Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. Paul is, and this is Paul who said we walk by faith and not by sight. This is Paul who said the just shall live by faith. This is Paul who said faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And God tells Paul, no, my grace is enough for you. Now, now, now that, that this type of grace is grace for grown-ups. This, this, this is when God is good. When you are immature and God tells you, oh, it's all right. I will bless you with that new house. You shout and give God all the praise because you got a new house. And say, oh, look at God's grace. Listen, even when you get a new job, you shout and praise and God, oh, look at God's grace and what he's done for me. But when he says no, can you stand there and still say, oh, look at God's grace when your house is burning down? Can you say, look at God's grace when you lose your job? Can you say, look at God's grace when you have to go through some physical ailment? Can you say, look at God's grace? This is the other side of grace. It is the grace for grown-ups, a grace that's for mature audiences only. My grace is sufficient. Tells Paul, I'm not going to change your circumstances, but I am going to give you a grace that you need to deal with it. Sometimes we just have to deal with it. Sometimes we just have to go through it. But how can I, how, how can something so beautiful as grace be so painful? How can something so wonderful cause me so much hurt? Can I illustrate it for you? And I promise I'm done. It's like a husband who wants to show his wife how much he loves her. And so he buys her a box of freshly cut roses. He wraps it in a box and puts a bow on it. And he gives her the box and she's standing there and her eyes are beaming. Her heart is pounding and she's excited to get the box. And she's so excited she, she can't hardly untie the bow fast enough. She opens the box and immediately she sees the beautiful roses. And she could smell the wonderful fragrance from the roses. And so she reaches inside in excitement and she grabs the roses, but she grabs them by the stem. Immediately, pain shoots up her arm. Blood begins to gush out of her hand. Something that's so beautiful and yet something so painful. Now, she has a choice. She can say to the rose, Rose, I reject you because you hurt me. You caused me some pain. Or she can become angry with her husband and say, Joker, if you really loved me, you would have taken the time to shave these thorns off this stem before you gave them to me. But watch this, you know what she does? You know what she does? Surprisingly, she doesn't throw down the rose to the ground. Nor does she become angry with her husband. She continues to hold the rose by the stem. In spite of the pain, because she knows that the intent of the giver was not to hurt her, but to show how much he loved her. So now, let me ask you a question. Can you hold God by the stem? By the stem when so 
one dies in your family. Can you hold God by the stem? When the doctor has told you it's cancer, can you hold God by the stem? When you are laid off from your job, because if you can hold God by the stick, that means you understand that God's intent wasn't to hurt you, but to show you that he still loves you. Yes, can you hold God by the stick when the pressures of life are weighing you down? It seems like you can't get no relief. Can you hold God by the seal when you've been calling on his name day after day, hour after hour, and still hadn't got an answer? Can you hold God by the seal when it seems like all of your friends done run out on you and you can't find nobody to help you? time of need. Listen, if you can hold God by the stem, let me tell you, you're in pretty good shape because it means that yay, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, you understand that he's still with you. You understand that you have a grace an understanding of grace that's for mature audiences only. That means your walk with God is pretty good and you know where your help comes from. But I don't want to just talk about y'all. Let me talk about those who stand to hold on to the stem. Let me give you some encouragement to hold on to that stem. I understand sometimes it may look a little weak. It may look a little weary. It may look a little grim. But let me tell you, we are reminded they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. If you just hold on a little while longer, if you just hold on to the stem of God, sometimes our walk may be a little different. Sometimes it may get a little heavy for us. But in spite of it all, understand it's through God's permissive will that we have to go through. It's through God's permissive will that we have to endure, that we have to deal with it. And he does it not to tell us that, not to hurt us, not to destroy us. What he, he does it to strengthen us. He does it to build you up. If you prayed about something that you won't fix, that you won't help with, you ever notice after you prayed, the very thing that you prayed for is what you have to go through? It's because he said, you won't help with it. Let me help you get through it. So we have to walk with them. We have to talk with them. We have to tell them, God, wherever you lead me, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take you at your word. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. The last two and a half years, three years have been difficult. But if you look back, you can say, I made it. If you look back, you can say, Lord, you promised from a mighty long way. We may have lost some loved ones along the way, but it strengthened you even more. So the door is open. I want to extend this privilege to you right now to let you know that God still loves you. Even if you're having to deal with a gift of a thorn, that you have to wake up day after day 
and deal with the bleeding and the suffering of it. It's only come to make you stronger. There's, a, there's another side that you'll see that you'll be able to give him some thanks and some praise and say, Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Listen, this past week, this past week, the late, great Reverend Darrell McNeely would have celebrated a birthday. And I get reminded of some of his messages and some of his sermons that he's preached and how he's encouraged and how he's motivated so many of us when he was here. And one of the things that I always remembered and always loved is how regardless of whatever it was, he knew he had a way of reaching you right where you needed to be reached and lifting you up. Through word, through scripture, through preaching, even through song, he blessed us. So this is what I want to do. Just in honor and reverence to him and how it, it, it encourages us through this message of grace and knowing that we don't get to the other side. Watch this. I've had some good days. I've had some years to climb. I've had some weary days. Hey, some sleepless nights.
from God, but our hearts are filled. Dismiss us from this place, but demo from your presence. Give us traveling grace and all earth. All the danger come upon us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.